Hey, welcome to Flatirons Online. Man, I'm so stoked that you're worshiping with us online today. And hey, one of the best things about our online community is that we have so many people watching from around the country and even around the world. So take a second, let us know in the comments where you're watching from. And if something sticks out from the message today, I encourage you, write that in the comment. Uh, we love to walk with you as you walk with God. I'd also love to invite you, if you live in Colorado, out to one of our five campuses across the Denver and Boulder area. Uh, our heart is for you to get connected. We wanna meet you, so reach out and get plugged in. If today has made an impact on you, if you love what God's doing through Flatirons, I just encourage you, take a second to like and share and subscribe to the channel. Uh, what God is doing at Flatirons is unique. We're glad that you're a part of it, and we know that someone in your life needs to hear the message today. So again, we're just so stoked that you're here, and I really hope that you enjoy the message today. Hey, welcome to uh, week two of this. Man, there's a lot of you. <laughs> Because it's fallback weekend. I get it. I get it. Some of you are here for the 11 and going, there's so many people, right? And, uh, you've been here for an hour. How many forgot to do their clocks? How many forgot? Me too, dude. Listen, all right. So like, I thought I overslept this morning to go to the gym and I'm driving to the gym and my truck automatically changed, but the one on my dresser did not. And it's, it was 2.37 and I'm on my way to the gym. And so I've been awake for a while. So... Uh, <laughs> So anyway, I'm just kind of dumb. Hey, hey, listen, uh, welcome to Flatirons. Campuses are all together right now. Uh, our guys down in Lyman, can we just say hi to them real quick? Uh, down there, listen. So good. Hey. hey, if you have a Bible with you, I want you to, get, to open it to Genesis chapter six. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's, there's bi stacks of Bibles in the back. If you have a Bible app or something like that, and you're gonna get something to write with because today, I'm just gonna be honest with you, uh, today might be the weirdest hour you've ever spent in church because we're gonna be looking at what I think is like the weirdest, um, least taught about or talked about five verses in the Bible because historically, this is how I grew up in church, if it's weird or it just doesn't make sense when you read it, we just skip over it and just keep on reading until we find something and go, oh, that does make sense. But, but if we could study these verses in the historical context, all right, uh, of the authors and their life and the, and the original audience, it will explain so much of what is happening, not just there in the Bible and in the rest of the Bible, but, but what we're gonna see today is what's happening in our world today, right? And it's weird, okay? So, so let's back up. If you weren't here, uh, get online and, and listen, but let's review a little bit from last week. If you were to ask most Christians in the world today, like, like why the world is so full of sin and pain and death, or if you were to ask most Christians why Jesus had to come and die on a cross, again, most of us would point to our story last week, the, Genesis chapter three, the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve's decision to use their free will and to reject God and disobey him to sin by eating that forbidden fruit. And the result of that was physical pain and death and then separation from God. Okay, that's it, right? And the application last week, if you were here, was this, nothing's changed, we still do the same things that they, they did, right, right? We find ourselves at the wrong place at the wrong time, having the wrong conversation with the wrong person, right? And then in the middle of that, something comes into our head or, or we see something, we see him, her, it, whatever that is, and then we go, you know what, I want that, her, him, what, right? And then we think, I don't just want it, I need it, all right? And then there comes a point where we make a choice, I choose the thing that God says will kill me, I just don't believe it will, until we find out God was right, and then we've lost a lot. A lot of us just say, that's my story. So the wages of sin is death, and if you die separated from God, the result is eternal condemnation. You belong to, we looked at this last week, right? you belong to the prince of death or the prince of darkness. That, that, that's, the, that's the destiny, all right? And when the Messiah comes, all right, when the Messiah comes, he has to fix that which we now look back and say, when Jesus died on the cross as payment for our sin, three days later rose from the dead, he did that. He removed sin and condemnation that separates us from God. And now, Christian, listen, even if or when your physical body dies, we live with, eternally with God. We don't have to have fear of death. Death has been defeated. So here's our first problem. Yes, Jesus removes our, our separation from God and conquers death. Check mark, Messiah, first one's accomplished there, okay? But if you were to ask Go back a couple thousand years and ask an Old Testament person or, or a, a Jewish person who lived when Jesus came in those years leading up to the arrival of Jesus, all right, that, what that Messiah would have to do to, to fix the problem in the world, right? They'd point to Genesis 3 as one of, the, one of the things the Messiah would have to accomplish, but they wouldn't stop there. They would also point to Genesis chapter 6, the verses that we're going to work through today. The Messiah's going to have to fix that too. 
Now, time out. There's gonna be, it's gonna feel like a big, long history lesson. And then at the end of it, you're gonna go like, oh, nothing's changed, right? Remember this, I said it a couple of times over the last couple of months, but we really have to have this going through our head. It goes like this. You gotta remember that the Bible was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. It was written for us, but not to us. And again, let me tell you, this is what I believe about the Bible. The Bible is the inspired and errant word of God. Its truths are timeless and eternal, and it's just as true and relevant today as it was when it was written thousands of years ago. But to understand what's really going on, what's really going on in here, like we have to dig beneath like the surface words on the page, that's called the context, and try to see what's really, really going on back then in, in the time and the history and the worldview of the original authors and their audience. Because here's the thing, right? Um, they, they lived in a different world. They knew things and were involved in things and experienced things that if we aren't aware of, we'll miss it. They knew it and took it for granted. But in today's study, you're gonna go like, if, if we, we take this out of context, it won't make any sense at all. Today, especially. See, when I say that the Bible is the true, inspired, inerrant word of God, the perfect word of God, here's what a lot of Christians do. We jump right to this. You never thought about this, but, but like where the Bible come from, this is where a lot of us jump to. We, we kind of imagine that the author's sat down at a desk and went into a trance and God took over their hand and about two hours later they woke up and there was thousands of words on a scroll, right? It's not true. It's not true. Look at this. The Bible is not a channeled message from God through puppet scribes. You gotta let that sink in, right? They didn't just like, I, I, I didn't know what I wrote down, but there it is. No, the Bible is the word of God given to specially prepared authors and scribes who were guided by the Holy Spirit. A guy named Paul writes about the Bible to a guy named Timothy. He writes this. He says, all scripture, everything in this book, all right, is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God, that'd be us, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in the same way that we looked at a couple weeks ago, that God breathed life into Adam, he also breathes his truth into these authors to write down God's eternal truths. So they do it with the Holy Spirit's guidance, all right? But please hear this. They also do it through their own life, their own perspective, their, their cultural context, the, the things they'd experienced in the world that they lived in. And here's why this is so important, okay? Again, it's history, but I promise this will make the Bible make more sense to you, okay? So the authorship of the book of Genesis, right, the first five books of the Bible, really, is credited to Moses, all right? And, and the stories and the truths that Moses taught were passed down over hundreds and hundreds of years, usually like orally, or maybe somebody wrote it down on a scroll or carved it into some tablets or something like that, all right? And it was scattered all over, all right? So in the years between the end of the Old Testament, there's a gap in there before Jesus is born, the New Testament. Most of the Jewish scholars and, and, and writers and, and theologians, they had been taken captive. Babylon had come in and invaded and, and taken them all captive back to Babylon as slaves. And while they're there back in another country, they are surrounded by Babylonian or, or Mesopotamian pagan or religious accounts of some of their stories. Creation, supernatural beings, the flood, how the universe works, the role of the gods in the world. And the, the, their stories were very similar, but then very different than what the Jewish people received from God. So they looked at each other and said, we gotta write this stuff down or it's gonna get lost. And they began to write down and organize what would become known as their Bible. Uh, the Jewish people call it the Torah, right? The, the Jewish scriptures. And it makes up about the first two thirds of the Bible that we're studying here, here today. See, again, this is new information for a lot of us. Like the first 11 chapters of the Bible were most likely written long after the rest of the, of the book of Genesis. Mostly to combat, or a literary term would be as a polemic, all right, in order to criticize what the Babylonians believed and then replace their belief system with the true story of Yahweh. The Bible probably originally started in chapter 12. Right? It starts with the telling of the story of Abraham and the beginning of God's chosen people. Chapters 1 and 11, though, set the framework for the rest of the Bible and why God needed a chosen people or a Messiah in the first place. So we've already answered part of the question, why is the world so messed up and what did the Messiah need to do in order to defeat death and separation from God? And today we're gonna to look at the second reason, Genesis chapter six. So if you have that in your Bible, we're gonna be in Genesis chapter six. And just so you know, Genesis chapter six take, kind of picks up the story about 1,500 years after Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden, okay? So by now there's a lot of people, right? And they're having lots of babies because the command is be fruitful and multiply. And they're like, that's our, that's our job. Let's go, all right? So, Genesis chapter six, verse one. This is, this, is, this is the weirdest verses in the Bible, I'm just telling you, right? 
When, when man or mankind began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, underline this, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever for he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. It gets worse, all right? The Nephilim, all right, underline that, they're important, all right, were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. That's in reference to the flood, all right? When or whenever the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them, they were the mighty men who were of old, the men of, uh, of, of renown. Okay, so let's unpack that, okay? Here's, here's, what, here's what we just read there, right? People are being fruitful and multiplying, and just like today, some of the children they're having are girls, that's how it works, all right? They're, they're having daughters, okay? And the sons of God, we'll come back to them in a minute, see that these daughters of mankind, it says they took them as their wives. It doesn't really translate that way. It just came down, they had sex with them, okay? And apparently this happens both before and then it repeats itself after the flood. I cannot wait for some of the conversations with your kids in the car home because <laughs> it gets weird here, right? So, so who are these sons of God? who are having sex with human women and giving birth to children called the Nephilim, right? And who are the Nephilim? We're gonna unpack all that, okay? And here's, here's the thing, right? I have never heard any of this in all my years of going to church. And I, I've been in church since the womb. Like my mom was the organist and I'm in there, you know? And I'm, I'm, I've been going to church for 61 years. I have not heard what I'm about to teach you taught on one time in the church. I have a degree in Bible from a Christian college. Nothing, not one mention of what I'm about to teach you today. Why? Because what is to follow, right, makes modern day Christians very uncomfortable because there's no other explanation except supernatural and we will see demonic activity going on in what happens here and get this, and extends into today. And most of us go like, I don't wanna talk about that, I don't wanna look at that, but it will explain so much, how about this, if we just let the Bible say what the Bible says, right? So let's look at these sons of God, all right? We've heard of them before. These sons of God are the same sons of God that preexisted and witnessed creation that we read about in the book of Job several weeks ago. Same, same group of guys, all right? These sons of God are the same sons of God that make up part of what the Bible calls the divine counsel, right? Again, I've never been taught on this, all right? But it's been in my, it's in every version of the Bible that I've had. I just skip over it. So who's the divine counsel? Supernatural divine beings who share God's image and also have free will that surround the throne of God. And God made a decision to share his rule and his authority with them in the spiritual realm. He doesn't need their help. He just wants to work with his creation. Same with us. Now you get to the New Testament, the New Testament doesn't call them sons of God after Jesus arrives, probably because it'd be confusing, but, ref but referring back to this event in Genesis chapter six, Peter, towards the end of the Bible, he describes what happened here. He says they were, they were angels that sinned. And then Jude calls them the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. Now I'll tell you where you got that in just a minute, right? Now, let's put all of this into context, all right? Because it's a continuous story, right? Last week in chapter three, we saw a supernatural divine being, the serpent, a guardian cherub, later to be identified as Satan, rebelling against God's plan and deceiving and hopefully destroying us, God's image bearers, in an attempt to elevate himself into the place of God by telling Adam and Eve that they didn't need God, they could be God. You can be, just, you can be your own God. And this week in chapter six, we see the supernatural sons of God, members of God's divine counsel, again, rebelling against God, taking on the form of men and having sex with the image of God, daughters of man, and having offspring with them, and their children are in their image. And these offspring are called the Nephilim. They're half human, half rebellious sons of God, and we'll find out they're demonic. Here's where it gets even weirder. Nephilim translates giant. Giants, they existed before and after the flood. They make appearances all through the first five books of the Bible. They were giants, but don't freak out and roll your eyes and, and go to the jolly green giant. He was 50, 75 feet tall. No, 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 no. The average height for a human being when the Bible was written was about five feet tall, right? The Nephilim were probably around seven feet tall, taller than any of the other people around. One shows up later in this story and he's, his name is Goliath and they say he's about nine feet tall and they are renowned for their mighty acts and they have one mission, destroy us, destroy us. So again, let's just review again, right? Last week in rebellion number one, we saw that the wage of sin is death and separation from God. And this week in rebellion number two, the rebellious sons of God and the Nephilim are gonna teach us how to destroy ourselves more efficiently. See, man was already bent towards sin. I am. 
In chapter six, the sons of God put human depravity on steroids. Now let's say time out here, okay? Let's go back to the beginning. Why was this being written down while the people were in captivity in Babylon? And the answer is as a polemic or as a counter argument to a different story or position that other people believed. And here it is, right? Every cult. So here's Israel and all the nations around them all had almost the exact same story that lines up with Genesis 6, 1 through 4 in their own cultures, almost. You know about something you didn't even know of. Um, the, the, to the Greeks, the sons of God and the Nephilim, they called them the Titans. Seen that movie? Right, who rebelled against the gods and were punished in, in Tartarus, the pit. We find out later in the book of Jude and Second Peter that the sons of God in Genesis 6 are sent to the same pit. So there's some, there's some truth in there. The Babylonians had taken Israel captive, so the Israelites are living in the middle of a pagan belief system. They had the same story too, but here's the thing. To the Babylonians, this is the best thing ever. It was a good thing, not a bad thing. To them, they believed that they could point to this event in Genesis 6, all right, and claim the gods picked us. The gods are responsible for our culture. They call them the Apkulus, all right? They mated with our women. They gave birth to great offspring, giant offspring, and taught us certain things. And that's why we are the greatest nation in the world, the greatest civilization in the world. And at that time, they were. So in order to see, now this is where some of you are gonna go like, as a Christian, I don't know if you should say that. Pray through it, you'll be fine. Listen, in order to see what the Babylonians believed, you have to see, and also the first writers of the Bible and what everybody who read the Bible when it was first written, they just knew it was going on, all right? In order to understand that, you have to step outside of the Bible and go to some historical records and writings. Many of them have only been discovered in the last like 60 years uh, through archaeology, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found all these writings about what was going on back then. Uh, there's this one book called First Enoch, all right? And there's just so much good stuff in there. The reason that these can be trusted is not because they're inspired. They're not the Bible. They're not. They're just historical accounts of what was going on back then. And the only reason that we can trust them is because both Peter and Jude read them and then quoted from them in their God-breathed inspired writings in the final books of the Bible. So they believed it was true. Now here's where it gets really, really interesting, okay? Here's what the Babylonians or the Mesopotamians believed about the sons of God or the Apulas, all right? When they came, this is what they believed, right? They helped us create our kingdom by teaching us about four, four main areas. First of all, they came and they taught us about astrology. The idea that the stars uh, and, and, and uh, uh, the, all the arrangements are, are, are gods and they should be worshiped because they guide and they control our destiny. So worship the stars. Write this down. Astrology is idolatry. Well, okay, all right, so it's not good, but how does it destroy us? Well, Back in Genesis 3, it says that even though we sin against God, we can turn back to the one true God and he will provide a way back into relationship with him, all right? Idolatry is turning away from the one true God and turning to something or someone else to do for you what only God can do. And for the record, all right, that's why, and this is for free, and this is, I'm gonna get emails about this, but I don't care, right? Listen, there's so much more to come. I'm gonna get more emails about it, right? Let me just talk to you. If you're into the whole horoscope thing and you think because you were born in a certain month under a certain sign, I'm an Aries, I'm a Sagittarius, and somehow that determines your destiny or your personality or any part of your life, that's called idolatry. It's, it's literally, it's blasphemy and you should repent and have nothing to do with it. it. It's more than those cute little pictures on your Chinese menu. It's idolatry and it's witchcraft, all right? And I know that hurts some of your feelings, all right? Only God determines a person's destiny, not the stars or constellations. So get it out of your life, right? Now, oh. I, I, I kind of like, I do read my, my menu at the Chinese restaurant. I gotta be honest with you, I do, right? And I pray about it. And everybody, okay, so. Here's the second thing they taught him. They taught him how to forge metal, one of the first civilizations to have metal, into weapons of warfare, and how to kill one another on a huge scale. Babylon developed metal weapons, had the greatest army in the world at that time. They, they had taken violence and war and murder and slaughtered their enemies, including Israel, by the thousands and thousands and thousands. They're very violent. And they were taught that by the gods, they said. They taught them, the, the book of First Enoch says this, it says they, they taught them the arts of seduction and sexual immorality. Like they made a sport out of rape and adultery and homosexuality. Jude compares what they did to why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The Babylonians took, took sexual perversion like to another level. 
Here's another one. They taught them how to make intoxicating potions out of roots and plants. They taught them how to make drugs to use to expand their minds and open themselves up to whatever the gods, the demons, may want to teach them or how they want to use them. Does any of that sound familiar? Idolatry, worship anything but the one true God, sexual morality, anything you want to do, gay, straight, doesn't matter, violence, murder, war, bloodshed, drug abuse, and drug addiction. Does it sound familiar? Because it comes from here. And the Babylonian says, yeah, we love it. This is what makes us great. And the Jews go, this is horrible. Now here's where, here's where it leads. Look at the next verse in chapter six, right? So the first four verses, it's, it's just on, on steroids, right? Here's where it leads in verse five. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And in the coming verses, which we're gonna get to the next couple of weeks, all right, uh, 120 years later, God sends a flood to wipe and wash away the wickedness and start over with Noah's family. We're gonna hit that next week. But, but, but the Nephilim, somehow, they make an appearance shortly after the flood, which means some more of the sons of God rebel. Right, so, so that by the time that Moses and, and Joshua, you know, they go to Egypt and, and they, they bring them out of Egypt and, and bring them into the promised land, they come to the river and they, and they send in spies. Remember this story? They send in 12 spies and 10 come back and go, we can't win. Why not? It's full of giants. And we're like grasshoppers compared to them. They'll crush us. And because of their lack of faith, God says, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Turn around. And they wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the entire generation that didn't have faith was dead. And then he brings them back to the same spot and says, now we're gonna do it. I want you to go in, I want you to drive out the people from the land, all right? But there are some cities I want you to devote to total destruction. Everything and everyone you find there because they're descendants of the Nephilim and they're demonic and I want them gone. Finally, you get to the book of Deuteronomy where Joshua declares victory over the land because, he, this is a quote, I have defeated and destroyed all of the Anahim, Rephaim, they're, they're the Nephilim, okay? He says, I've destroyed them all except a few, that escaped to the land of the Philistines, which years later, David kills the rest, most famously Goliath. Now again, so what? Why is this so important today? Because here's the thing, right? Because the sons of God that did that with the daughters of men, here's what Jude says. It says, they have been kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. That is a direct quote from First Enoch. And the last Nephilim died at the sword of King David and his men. Although... There's a lot of people across this planet who believe they're still here. I know one. I mean, I don't know a Nephilim. I saw a really big dude in the airport the other day, and I'm like, oh, it's a, it, it, gave me, it freaked me out. Like, There's one right there. But uh, <laughs> No, I, I have a friend who knows, uh, knows a guy who lives in Israel who's trying to collect 200 Nephilim so when the Antichrist comes, they'll protect him. Now, that's just that guy. And that's kind of weird. But how is that relevant? Well, you have to go back to what they, what, what they knew and what they believed back then. Especially, what did Jesus believe? Because here's my theology. Whatever Jesus believed, I'm with that. I'm going with that, okay? What did the rest of the writers of the Bible, what did they know and believe? That we have never connected the dots. And this, is, this might be the most disturbing thing you've, you've heard at, here. I mean, you've heard some disturbing stuff in here. This might be at the top of the list. It goes like this. When the Nephilim were killed... Their disembodied spirits, remember they're half spirit, half human, right? Became demons that populated the world of Jesus and populate our world still today because they're eternal. All right, remember this story? Okay, this is how I know Jesus believed that, right? Um, Mark chapter five, if you want to follow along in this. Look, they, the disciples, so Jesus and his 12 followers, right? They came to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to the country of the Gerasenes, all right? And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, Immediately there met him out of the cemetery a man with an, what's it say? Unclean spirit. Remember that, okay? And, and, and when, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before Jesus and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying, Jesus was saying to him, come out of the man, you, here it is again, unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what's your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And you read the rest of this chapter, Jesus casts these unclean spirits into a herd of pigs. They run down a cliff and they die in the sea. So the pigs are dead, but the demons are spiritual beings. They just have to go find another place to live. But they're still around, according to the Bible, until the final judgment in Revelation. But the part I want you to catch is this. First of all, the demons in Legion, they, they immediately recognize Jesus. We know who you are because they've met before. 
Because Jesus pre-existed Bethlehem, remember that? And they've been around for a long, long time, all through the Old Testament. But in this passage, all right, it doesn't say demons, and it doesn't say spirit. It says unclean spirit. And, and here's what they know, but we don't know. In the Jewish faith, the thing that makes something unclean is improper mixtures. I, I'm going to make I'm going to make the Book of Leviticus make more sense than it has maybe in the past. All right. For example, all through the Jewish law, you find in Leviticus, you find the weirdest laws in there. Like, like don't combine that cloth with that cloth and make a, don't, don't do, make a shirt out of that, all right? Or don't cook that in the same pot as that. And it doesn't make sense until you realize that they are physical reminders that as the people cross this river and go into this new land, here's the reminder. Don't combine your faith with a false religion and idolatry. And don't forget about Genesis 6 and what happens when things that were never supposed to intermingle, mingle and violate the law. And the result is what you're about to experience. In order to take possession of your promised land, you have to go and face and kill demonic giants. And that's still true in our life today. We have giants in our life that we have to defeat. And again, this is new. This is a lot, isn't it? This is a lot. Some of you are here from last night going, I got, I, I got 30% of that. I'm back. All right, right? But, but, but it's new for us, but it was basic reality when it was written, especially at the time of Jesus, they knew where demons came from. They knew what demons would do in a person's life. And the Jewish people knew that when the Messiah came, he would not only have to fix death and separation from God, but he would also have to fix the inner depravity, the brokenness, the darkness of the human heart that succumbs to sin and demonic temptation. He's got to fix that too. And here's how Jesus does that, okay? Right, let's go back to the first one. In order to beat death, you have to have a resurrection. In order to have a resurrection, Jesus had to die. So he did that. But over and over throughout his teaching, Jesus taught his disciples, and they never really understood this till after Jesus had returned to heaven and, and it actually happened. He says, I'm going to have to suffer. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to nail me to a cross. I'm going to die. They're going to stick me in a tomb. But I promise I'll be resurrected. And then I'm going to return to my father. And they're like, no, no, no. He goes, no, I need to return to my father. And here's why. Jesus promised that he would send us the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised he would send you the Holy Spirit who would live in every believer and through an inner transformation of the inner person, not external laws and rules, but changing the inside of a person who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, sin and depravity would be defeated. And from the inside out, we will become closer and closer to the image of Jesus Christ. So again, we're going, so what's the application? What are we going to do with this when we walk out of here in 15 minutes? What is it, right? And this is the part that's going to get me in trouble. This is a, uh, with a certain segment of this population and a bunch of online trolls. So here comes the bait. <laughs> I, you know, I've given up on the sign. I need everybody to like me. I don't care. I'm just going to preach what Jesus tells me to preach. And y'all pray through, okay? <laughs> you haven't heard what I'm about to say. I think I clap back right there. Okay, so. so remember, we've, we've hit this like 10 times in the last couple of months. Look at this. This is Paul right here. He goes, finally. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. They're real. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, one another, but against that. And he could, he could just say, all those people that Jim's talking about. Right? Because this is the list of them. We don't wrestle against one another, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Do you know what Paul, the writer of that, is kind of telescoping to us 2,000 years after it was written? If it was written today, he'd go like, hey, hey, 2023 Christians, wake up. The fallen sons of God and the demons that they spawned, they've lost their authority because of the cross. They can't make you do anything, but make no mistake, they are still here and they still delight in your destruction. And their goal is to steal, kill, and destroy you and to help you destroy one another. And your only hope is to put on the full armor of God. Hey, people, we have to know the truth so we can, so we can recognize the lie. We have to, we have to know righteousness. We have to, we have to know the gospel of Jesus. You have to have faith in, in Jesus and, and you have to know the word of God and the spirit within you will help you see what's going on around you so you can be strong and take your stand. All right, we gotta wake up. Listen, you cannot be forgiven and in a relationship with God without faith in Jesus. That's what Jesus taught us. And today, here's what we're learning. You cannot overcome temptation and brokenness without the spirit of God in you. If you could, you already would have. He will give you, the Holy Spirit will give you the strength to stand and eyes to see and to recognize what's really going on in the world around you on a spiritual level. It's not just he's doing that to her or she's doing that over there. It's not about politics. It's not about what's going on in the middle. No, it's not, there's something more going on. I, I'm gonna, okay, let's just go deep, all right? I, I'm going I'm to bring up a touchy subject from a few weeks ago. 
Maybe you saw it because a half a million of you commented on it. Okay, so I stood up here. Some of you going, oh, I know, I know. All right. I stood up here and I said, I believe there's a direct connection to what's happening in our government, in our education system, in the collapse of our marriage and our families, the assault on our children and on their identities and gender and the normalization of all sexual immorality and the rejection of anything that is connected to Jesus Christ. I stand on that. I totally believe that because Jesus believed it and the Bible teaches that, that all of these things have a direct connection to the demonic realm. Now listen to this, right? Even if those in, who are involved in it in the implementation of it, right, are, are not even aware of it. See, I, I, listen, I'm not saying that this politician or that politician of either party, of either party, how many parties? Either, I'm not, all right, I'm not picking on one or the other, right? They're both just jacked up as gonna be, right, right? I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that that famous celebrity or, the, or that, 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 that athlete over there or just because some superstar pop star who sells out stadiums while singing dressed as a witch. I'm not saying that... <laughs> Makes sense. See, that's what I'm getting more emails about right there. <laughs> I'm not saying they're worshiping Satan. I'm not saying they have idols and altars at their home, you know, and, and, and eating, you know, flesh. I'm not saying they're right. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know them. But I will say this. And again, I will die on this mountain. For all of us, for all of humanity, without knowing the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit, without knowing and holding on to what Jesus says is right and true, you can be used by Satan or blinded to what Satan is up to without even knowing it's happening in your life. Or even, even if you say, I don't believe that's possible, all right, until it's too late and you lose more than you ever could have imagined. See, I do. I do think this. I do think we have some really bad politicians out there, some educators, some celebrities, some social influencers, some pastors, right? Who, who don't know the word of God or they do know the word of God, but they changed it or kind of left some out to make it more palatable and more inclusive. And without even realizing it, they're carrying out a demonic agenda that eventually will reverse itself and we're going to get destroyed. God, I'm, I'm, I'm fired up. Listen, if I, I'll be honest with you. All right. If I hear one more speech pointing at Jesus and saying, Hey, let's just all be tolerant. All right. And just love one another and all get along. I'm going to lose my mind. Uh, listen, listen, of course, Jesus wants us to love everyone. But loving others will never include you letting go of Jesus and his word and what Jesus says is true. Even if it costs you everything, we have to hold on to Jesus. Listen, I'm, I'm gonna give you a side of Jesus going, this is not warm, fuzzy Jesus. Here, this is not, you know, this is baby Jesus left the manger. This is, this is Jesus, okay? Matthew chapter 10, right? Some of you going, I did not know that was in the Bible. I know, there's so much in there. Look at this. So, this is Jesus talking. Everyone who acknowledges me, like confesses me before each other, I also will confess before my Father who's in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I, look at this, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Sermon on the Mount, I never knew you. Right? And here's where it gets interesting. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. What? Who's, who's saying that? This is Jesus talking. Don't think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, which isn't hard. And a person's <laughs> enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more, more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves their, their son or their daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What? what did, this is what Jesus just said here. He says, hey, if you want to follow me, it means going to war. Holding on to Jesus and rejecting anything that's not Jesus. And that will, this, he says, this is what's going to happen. You're going to hold on to me, and it's going to cause your family to break apart, because you'll have to choose between them and family. It might mean like losing your life, sacrificing your agenda or your job path, all right? Yeah, yeah, and taking up a cross in order to follow him. That doesn't sound much like, can we all just tolerate each other and get along and coexist? You're right, it doesn't. It means there's a battle going on for the souls of people all over the earth and the stakes are really high and we know that Jesus has already won in the end, but right now we have to do this, Ephesians 6, all right? We have to be strong in the Lord and in his strength and in his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You don't need armor if following Jesus is a picnic in the park surrounded by daisies and unicorns and Jesus fairy dust. And that's what you expect is why you're getting knocked down, right? It's a battle, 
not against one another, a spiritual war. So the application is this. I'm going to summarize Ephesians chapter six. Be strong in the Lord so the devil doesn't knock you down again. I'm just, I'm just so tired of, of being defeated by the same thing again. Going back to the same tree again. So can, 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 that, can that cycle break? And the answer is yes, it is possible. Why? How can you say that, Jim? Because you have a Jesus. He's amazing. You have a Messiah that promises if you would turn from anything you're doing, sin, and you just call on his name. We're going we're gonna to sing that song here in a minute, right? Just call on the name. If you put your faith and trust in what he did for you on the cross, that he rose again, defeating death and separation from God, no matter what you've done, you will be forgiven. You will be saved and nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. He's defeated death. That can be yours today. How? Call on him. Call on Jesus. I just need you to save me. I can't do this by myself anymore. But not only that, that's good enough. But also you have a Jesus, you have a Messiah who keep, keep, kept, keeps his promise that at the moment of your salvation, and some of you, hundreds of you are gonna get baptized next week. You have no idea, but you are. I'm a prophet. There you go, right? You, 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 you are, right? And here's what's gonna happen. This is what the Bible says. His spirit will come and live inside of you. And at that point on, right now the spirit's just drawing you. But when he comes and lives inside of you, he will begin to heal and transform everything that sin and Satan have tried to rip you off have taken from you. He wants to give you back something better. Jesus says this, all right? You can try it on your own, but on your own, you cannot do anything, right? You can't save yourself, you can't fix yourself, or you already would have, but we're not talking about on your own. Jesus goes on and says, but with God, all things are all things. And that's why you can be saved. And that's why you don't have to live a defeated life anymore. That's why you don't have to walk around with sin and shame and regret for the rest of your life because it's finished. Our Messiah has taken care of that. We just have to lean into him, put our faith and trust in him and follow him. Okay, I, I'm done. I want to leave you with this. All our campuses, let's stand up together, right? Next, next weekend um, is baptism weekend, all right? And um, we're going to take a look at... Peter, okay, all right? And, and Peter makes a connection. We're gonna look at, he makes a connection between Noah and the flood. And then he talks about the Nephilim and the sons of God in prison. And then he says, and it's all kind of like baptism that saves you. Like, that's the most random combination I've ever heard in my life, right? Here's the point. Kind of a spoiler alert, right? Some of us, we got baptized for half the good reasons, but there's a whole other reason to get baptized that, that we've neglected. So you do, I, I'm telling you, you do not want to miss next, n n next week. Let me just lean into a little bit more. I want you to ask yourself this. When you got baptized, what were you hoping would happen? What were you hoping on? Uh, well, on the other side of that, of that water, what, what were you hoping would happen? And all of us got a list. I need this to change. I need this to change. Let me ask you this. What did you leave behind? What do you say? I'm choosing Jesus, but if I choose Jesus, I, I cannot serve two masters. And some of us are serving two masters, which is why we're going nowhere. Life is tug of war, right? So we're going to look at what it does it mean to follow Jesus and what does it mean to let go of the thing that's holding us back. We're going to sing this amazing song uh, about calling on the name of Jesus. It's, I mean, it's not this big formula. It's like, I mean, in this moment right now, you can say, Jesus, I believe as much as I can believe that you're the son of God, you died for my sins, you rose from the dead, you sent your Holy Spirit to live in, I don't wanna live, I don't wanna breathe one more breath without being a reality in my life. You can do that right, right now. And he will be all that you need. I, lo I love this song, uh, it's Jehovah, um, uh, Yahweh, it's the same in two different languages, but, but all through scripture, he has different names attached to Jehovah. Like, um, I mean, Gideon's going into to battle. He's like, I'm going to get defeated. Well, my name is Jehovah Nisi. I'm the God who fights for you. Some of you just need, I mean, you're like, I just need someone on my side. He's Jehovah Jireh. Some of you are going, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I, I, I'm empty. I don't have it. He's Jehirah, Jehovah Jireh. He will supply everything you need. He's Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals the broken places in our life. You need some healing? He's Jehovah Rapha. Here's what I think all of us need. Jehovah Shalom. Some of us just need some peace because life is chaos. And he'll be your Jehovah 
shalom. So God, in this moment, um, we ask you to be yourself, to do what only you can do. I'm, I'm looking forward to Christmas and Jesus, your name translates God saves. And that's, that's, that's what you do. But at Christmas, you become Emmanuel, God with us. And that's who you are. We just need you to be with us right now. We don't wanna go into the battle again alone. We don't wanna fight alone. We don't wanna carry this burden alone anymore. So will you come and be a part of our life because you're Jehovah. And we worship you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for tuning in to Flatirons Church Online. Hope you enjoyed it today and that God moved in a mighty way. We want to let you know that we have brand new content coming out all the time, including live streams every single Sunday. And if you don't want to miss out on any of that content, make sure that you hit the subscribe button. We also want to let you know that if you believe in what Flatirons is doing, and that's to reach a lost and broken world, there's a give button that you can hit to take next steps there. Well, we hope you enjoyed it and we can't wait to see you next time.